Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, let's go. This is such a mess. Many people here commented about what my cousin would probably do in retaliation. And I was naive about it because they were exactly right. I last posted on Reddit about my cousin who gave me a junk beach cruiser bike out of his parents' backyard when my mountain bike got stolen. I cleaned up and fixed up the beach cruiser, and then suddenly my cousin wanted me to either pay him $60 for it or give it back because he wanted to sell it after I made it purdy. But the rest of the family, including his parents, basically told him to grow up when he tried to get them involved. Then he found out about my AITA post. One of his friends apparently saw it and told him, either here or on a podcast or something, I don't know. But word spread around. The whole family found out because my cousin ranted to them. But none of them are angry with me. They actually sympathize with me for even feeling like I had to make the AITA post to begin with when my cousin was so clearly in the wrong. My cousin ended up freaking out over it and confronting me on my way home from work. This time he demanded even more money for the bike. He said that since I love Reddit so much, he was taking an a-hole tax for humiliating him. And the cost of the bike was now $80. He ranted about how paying him $80 for the bike was the least I could do after I humiliated him. I refused and said that he was acting like a grifter, and the bike was hardly worth anything. I put an effort to make it rideable, while he let it rot in his parents' backyard for years. It was junk when I started, and I made it work. Then I listed all the things I did to fix it and how much it would have cost at the bike shop to fix it instead. He somehow still didn't see my point and still stated he wanted the money now or he'd be taking the bike back whether I liked it or not. I told him I was done with this and tried to ride off. But he grabbed me and pulled both me and the bike over before I could ride away. I said what the hell man while I was getting up and then he actually slugged me in the face. It didn't break my nose but really freaking hurt. And it made me bleed. Then he took my bike and rode off with it. I'm older than my cousin by two years and taller too. But he's built way sturdier than me, since his father is a bit of a husky and strong guy, and he inherited that body type. So he had no problem knocking me down and robbing me. Someone came over to help me up, and then I called the cops. Family or no family, I wasn't about to just let him get away with doing that to me. And the altercation happened right in front of a shop with CCTV which the cops later got video from. I got taken to the hospital to have my face checked, and my cousin was arrested by police at his apartment. He had the bike there too, and had even already listed it for sale online, but took it down later. Thanks to something someone commented on my last post, I documented the serial numbers of the bike by photographing them and writing them down at home. So I got my bike back from the police without much issue. My cousin tried to tell police the bike was still his, but I had texts on my phone from back when he said I could have it. And lots of other text evidence of the harassment that followed. Plus, his parents were there when he gave the bike to me, and the whole family knew he'd tried to grift me. So he surrendered it, and the bike was returned to me at the station. My boss gave me a couple days off work to recover. The injury to my nose was thankfully minor. So I'm doing fine. My cousin didn't get off easy, though. After he was arrested, he was found to have been drinking. So now he's been charged for theft, assault, and underage drinking since he's not 20, one yet. He called his parents to come bail him out, but they refused after finding out what he did to me. They came to see me after a couple days and were extremely apologetic. They said they had no idea he'd do such a jerk move to me. They also said he'd been asking for money a lot lately, and likely was spending that all on his habits. None of us have any idea where he got the alcohol or what kind of long-term punishment he's in for but I doubt he's going to get off very lightly from this when he goes to court. I did get questioned about whether or not I can press charges, but the police already have the video of the assault and theft, and my cousin is still getting charged for underage drinking, so no one is really asking me to try and speak on his behalf. I don't really want to either. And since I waited a few days longer to post this, my cousin is now out of jail, and his parents have learned from him that he was also behind on rent, and is now facing eviction since his lease was month to month. He was also fired from his job for being a no-show since he was stuck in jail for a few days. One of my friends works in that same place too, 
and my cousin had already been on thin ice for bad behavior, a lot of tardiness, and repeatedly not showing up for work. So getting arrested was the last straw for his boss, and he was fired. So now he's looking at misdemeanor charges, has no job, and is getting evicted. All because he had to be a jerk and a grifter. From what my parents and his parents tell me, he acted like everything was all my fault. But his parents have shut that down and chewed him out over the fact that he beat me up and stole from me. And this is karma for that. Then they made him promise to leave me alone from here on out. I've heard his parents aren't going to be letting him move back into his old room either. Instead, they plan on putting him up in the loft above their garage. Which isn't exactly roomy, has plywood walls, and there's no AC up there for the summer heat. I went back to my routine of riding the bike to and from work, and I haven't been bothered about it anymore by any of my cousin's jerk friends. In fact, they seem to have completely distanced themselves from me and anyone else I know. So none of them made any attempt to apologize. But I don't care, since I don't really know them. It's just insane that all this was over a used beach cruiser. It's not even an expensive one. I'd like to ask my cousin one day if it was worth it. But I don't want to see his face again anytime soon. Update. I expected not to post about my cousin again. But he came to bother me one more time yesterday. He saw my last post and came pounding on my door. Rather than open it, I spoke to him through my window just in case he was ready to take another swing at me. I had my phone ready and recording. He started yelling at me about how I've humiliated him, got him arrested, got him fired, and ruined his life. Then he started pounding on my door and demanding I open it so he could kick my butt. I told him he would welcome to try. But I was recording him, and I had a baseball bat ready to use if he tried to break in. So, go ahead, make my day. He chose to back off but was demanding I take down my post. I told him it was too late. He had the option to be civil long ago, and I was done with him. I could care less what his so-called friends think of him. They egged him on to steal the bike from me anyway. A bike he gave to me as junk. It's not valuable, just because I fixed it up. Even at the bike shop, they said that unless it had new tires put on it, it was only worth about $40. Then my cousin said I should have given him $40 then. I basically said, you got to be kidding me. You're still saying that crap after you got yourself arrested. I should be surprised. But I'm not. I put in the work fixing up that bike on a budget because I was broke. It was worthless when you gave it to me. You didn't make it worth anything. I did. That means its value is to not you but I don't care to debate this with you anymore. You just want money any way you can get it, and I'm done. Go home and don't talk to me again until you decide you actually want to act like an adult. He cussed me out some more, but finally left when I said I was going to call the police if he wasn't gone by the count of five. I decided I'm going to file for a restraining order. I've spoken with my parents and my cousin's parents, and they all agree it's for the best to keep him away. I've already filed a police report on my cousin for threatening me, And on my next day off, I'm going over to the courthouse to file for the ERO. If my cousin has any brain cells left, he'll know to stay away after getting served. Unless he wants to get even more charges added to his impending court case. His parents also threaten not to let him move into the garage loft if he goes near me again. So hopefully I won't need to post here ever again. Update 2. Well, it's over. My cousin, after a lot of convincing, plead guilty since he really couldn't fight any of the charges. He was brought upon theft, assault to battery, underage drinking, and harassment. He was sentenced to a few months in county jail, followed by two years probation and anger management classes. My cousin acted like he'd gotten so much worse as he was pretty emotional about it. Not exactly crying or angry. Just emotional. That's really the best way I can put it since I was not there to see it. He did originally try to aim for not guilty. But the public defender he got, and his parents basically told him he had no chance of fighting the charges because of the clear evidence against him. There was CCTV footage of him attacking and robbing me. Cell phone footage of him showing up at my apartment to try and attack me. Screenshots of the ad he put up of the bike he stole from me. The police report on his being intoxicated from underage drinking. And all of the harassment I got from him and his friends. 
He really had no choice but to raise a white flag plead guilty, or he'd have possibly gotten a longer sentence. He's sitting in county jail now. And when he gets out, he'll likely go back to living in the loft above his parents' garage. He finally gave up on blaming me since no one sided with him. All of his so-called friends ghosted him, too. And he was forced to write out an apology to me by his parents. I did get the restraining order against him. But it's only good for a year. We'll see if his behavior changes and whether or not I'll need to renew it. But I want nothing to do with him for the foreseeable future. I wouldn't say dead to me. But I don't want to speak to him, let alone look at his face anytime soon. Other than that, I may as well fill in a few more details. The bike is still riding well. I put slime sealant in the tube since one of them developed a slow leak. I found the spot with the leak, dabbed a drop of super glue onto it, then squirted a generous amount of slime into the tube. There hasn't been a leak since. And yes, I did get a proper lube for the chain. I also re-greased the crank bearings. Before going to jail, my cousin had a miserable time in that loft above his parents' garage. The summer heat made it very hot up there, and he had no air conditioner. Not that anyone would give him one. So he just had to use several fans. Rumor is he stole a couple of those fans because they were clearly not new and just appeared out of nowhere. He was broke, so the family think odds are he didn't buy them. He didn't bother looking for a new job since he knew jail was imminent. And since he's a known thief, I wouldn't doubt it if he prowled around at night taking whatever he could grab. But I'm not going to make assumptions. I'll leave that to everyone else. The most ironic thing is my cousin had to either walk or ride his father's bicycle if he wanted to go anywhere. He used to have a motorbike, but had to sell it because he had debts to pay. All his good stuff, like his PC, gaming systems, motorbike, furniture, and even some expensive shoes, he had all had to be sold. Pretty much anything he had of value was sold, either online or in a garage sale. So when he gets out of jail and eventually has to find a job again, he'll have to start from square one. I didn't really have any sympathy for him. He caused all of this to happen after all. His life is going to be screwed for a long time with jail on his resume, too. If you hear nothing from me about my cousin on this site again, then you'll know he's leaving me alone. This one is not technically my revenge, but some revenge I got to see up close and take joy from and slightly participate in. The background is most of the story, so this will be a little long. Trigger warning for self-harm. I was in the Navy and stationed on the submarine base in Connecticut. I had a friend I met in boot camp, and we were in the same class for our school, Navy job training. We'll call that friend Bill. Now, Bill wasn't the most physically fit guy. He was short, kind of chubby, and wore glasses. However, Bill was really smart, and as the sonar technician he was meant to be, he would have been amazing. He had a pragmatic way of looking at things I really valued in a friend, and I know it would have made him successful if he had made it out to the fleet. While in school, we had a couple of petty officers that were hard asses. They somehow convinced themselves they were super soldiers, despite the fact that our jobs in that field are really nerd-centric. You get picked for that job because of your math and computer skills, not your deadlift number. Still, they were both all about being fit and working out all the time. We would do physical training three times a week, and while most of us could keep up, Bill often fell behind on runs or didn't quite meet what these two idiots believed to be the standard. To be clear, Bill did pass the minimum requirements for fitness. He just didn't go as extreme as these guys. I denote for other Navy vets. He got the McPond coin for how hard he pushed himself at Pete the day he visited. The end result was that they would constantly berate and belittle Bill. They'd call him fat, lazy, and everything else. They'd tell him he should kill himself. You name it. They were always on his ass, despite him passing his assessments. At some point, Bill pushed himself too hard and injured his knee. He told these petty officers he was injured and had been seen by the doc on base. The doc had put him on light duty so the knee could recover. He had the paperwork to back it up. They elected to ignore that and threaten him with kicking him out if he didn't do the workouts. So Bill kept pushing himself, injuring himself more, and his mental health degraded the whole time. In my time in the Navy, you didn't get mental health services. Really, the only person to talk to like that was the chaplain. For those who don't know, the chaplain is the religious leader, 
usually a pastor or priest rabbi that is signed up as a commissioned officer. Our chaplain was the sweetest little woman you ever met, but as a chaplain, she held the rank of captain, high-ranking officer. So Bill set up a meeting with the chaplain to talk about things. When Bill informed the petty officers he would be missing class the next day for his chaplain meeting, they yelled at and berated him more. They called him a pussy, useless, not fit for the Navy, and everything else you can imagine. They convinced Bill he was being weak and the chaplain wouldn't care about his issues, that nobody would care. They promised to make life even harder if he didn't show the next day. So he canceled his meeting. Evidently, bad luck hit, and that night his girlfriend was also breaking it off with him. She wasn't worth his time or money, but he couldn't see that. That night I awoke to a 3 0 call from Bill. I couldn't hear anything, and I asked several times, Bill, you there? Are you okay? It wouldn't have been the first time that I got a drunk dial from one of my friends after a hard day like Bill had. Sailors have been known to drown their sorrows a bit. Eventually, I figured it was a butt dial drunk dial and hung up and went back to bed. I still regret that decision. The next day, all hell broke loose. Me and a couple other friends got calls from Bill's now ex-girlfriend informing us he was in the hospital because he slit his own throat. Turned out a few of us got that 3, 0 a.m. call but Bill couldn't speak at the time and was kind of out of it due to blood loss. We finished what we had to do on base and rushed over to the hospital. As we got there, the chaplain was on her way out, and we passed her in the hallway. She spoke to us briefly to say that Bill would be okay and she wouldn't forget this. I've never seen a look on someone's face that so accurately depicted raw, unfiltered raid. It took us all by surprise because she was such a small, sweet, and personable lady. But the look in her eyes... You could just tell she wanted someone to pay for this. She wanted revenge, and we all knew she wore the kind of rank that could get it done. We visited Bill, who could barely talk, but he told us the story of what had happened, what he was thinking at the time, and how glad he was it didn't work. Apparently, it was cold enough that the blood clotted on the outside of his neck and made a kind of patch that kept him alive long enough for the MS to find him and get him to a hospital. The doctor said he missed his carotid by about a millimeter. A week went by and we hadn't heard anything until we got called in by the chief of the training command, the boss to these petty officers. He said he wanted to check on the rest of us and make sure there weren't any other issues with these guys he wasn't aware of and that we were all okay. I let him know about an ass chewing he gave me a few months back that it was really set up by these guys and they had lied to him. My friends cited a couple other examples of their own with these guys being generally shitty, dishonest people. I don't think it mattered. I think their fates were already sealed and we were being asked for more ammo to bury them with. The next day they were nowhere to be found and we were introduced to new instructors who would be taking over our training permanently. After class I decided to stop by and ask the chaplain what happened. She told me she had never been more disgusted by the actions of a sailor than these two guys who convinced someone not to come see her. She teared up a bit regretting that she didn't get the chance to help Bill before he made his attempt. In her mind, it was these two that precipitated and enabled Bill's attempt. So on to the revenge. The chaplain told me she went to the admiral in charge of the entire base and demanded their immediate discharge. He granted it. Both petty officers were immediately processed out with dishonorable discharges. I can't remember the exact charge I heard they cited for it, but I know the Navy has a way of selling BS on paper when they want a certain outcome. Especially officers at that high level. So basically, they get no via benefits of any kind, got kicked out of the base housing they lived in, and could probably only find work at a gas station or under the table stuff somewhere. Also, I know from someone else who got the boot that the Navy only pays for a single bus ticket to get you back home, not your family or any of your belongings. When you have a discharge like that, no company with Dodd contracts is allowed to hire you. That includes McDonald's because they have stores on bases throughout the country. Taco Bell, Subway, etc. None of them will give you a job. They can't and they don't want to anyway. So I don't know where these guys went or what became of them, but I know their lives were irrevocably ruined. One of them had about 18 years in, so he was two years from retirement and lost it all. The other was at about 12 years, so he also lost a lot. Wherever they are now, I'd be very surprised to hear they're making more than minimum wage. As for Bill, Well, he made a full recovery. He got a full medical discharge, which is an honorable discharge that meant F5 pay for the rest of his life, full benefits, 
and a referral to a counselor in his home state once he got back there. All paid for by the Navy. We lost touch over the years, but I did see on Facebook he got himself together, became a police officer, and got married. I'm excited to tell you all a story that happened to me a few weeks ago. It's a bit of a long one, so grab a cup of coffee and settle in. Let me start with a little backstory about myself. I'm a college student, working part-time as a cashier at a small boutique store. I've always been a bit of a people, pleaser, so I usually go out of my way to make customers happy. Unfortunately, that hasn't always worked out for me. It was a beautiful day outside, and I had decided to spend my afternoon shopping with my best friend. We were browsing through a store, trying on clothes and laughing at each other's choices. That's when we saw her, the entitled woman. She had a sour look on her face, and I could tell she was going to be trouble. My friend and I were browsing through the clearance rack when the woman walked up to us. Excuse me, she said with a snarl. I need to look at those shirts. I tried to be polite, so I said, of course I'll move out of your way. But as I stepped aside, the woman shoved past me, nearly knocking me over. I was taken aback by her rude behavior, but decided to let it go. My friend and I continued shopping, and I found a cute dress I wanted to try on. I walked over to the fitting rooms, but the entitled woman was already inside, taking up two stalls. Excuse me, I said, knocking on the door. May I use one of the fitting rooms? The woman opened the door and gave me a once-over. I'm not finished yet, she said, slamming the door in my face. I was starting to get frustrated, but I didn't want to cause a scene. So my friend and I continued shopping until we found a few more items we wanted to try on. When we got back to the fitting room, the entitled woman was still inside. Excuse me, I said, knocking on the door again. Are you finished yet? No, she said, but I'm not leaving until I've tried everything on. I was getting fed up with her entitled behavior, so I decided to speak up. Excuse me, I said, raising my voice a bit. You've been in there for quite a while, and my friend and I would like to try some things on as well. Would you mind letting us use one of the stalls? The woman looked at me with disgust. I was here first, she said. You can wait your turn like everyone else. I could feel my blood boiling at this point, but I tried to keep my cool. Actually, I said, we were here before you, and we've been waiting patiently for you to finish. So if you don't mind, we'd like to use one of the stalls. The entitled woman huffed and puffed, but eventually she stepped out of the fitting room. My friend and I quickly went inside and tried on our clothes. As we were leaving, the entitled woman stopped us. You know, she said, you could have waited your turn like everyone else. You're not special. I couldn't help but roll my eyes at her comment. Actually, I said, I think you're the one who needs to learn some manners. You can't just take up two fitting rooms and expect everyone else to wait for you. The woman looked like she was about to explode. How dare you! She yelled. I'm a paying customer, and I demand to be treated with respect. At this point, I was done with her entitled behavior. You know what? I said, you're right. You are a paying customer, and we should treat you with respect. But respect is a two-way street, and you haven't shown any to us. You've been rude and entitled since the moment you walked in here. The entitled woman glared at me, but I didn't back down. You know what? She said, her voice dripping with venom. I don't have to take this from you. I'm taking these clothes, and there's nothing you can do about it. She grabbed the clothes she'd been trying on and stormed out of the store. My friend and I looked at each other in disbelief. We'd never encountered someone so entitled before. As we were leaving the store, I saw the entitled woman getting into her car. I couldn't help myself. I walked over and knocked on her window. Excuse me, I said, I hope you know that stealing is illegal. The woman sneered at me. I didn't steal anything, she said. I'm just not going to give this store my business anymore. I couldn't help but laugh at her ridiculous statement. Okay, I said, you do you? My friend and I walked away, shaking our heads. We couldn't believe how entitled and rude some people could be. As we were walking down the street, my friend turned to me and said, you know, I'm proud of you for standing up to her like that. I don't think I could have done it. I smiled at her. Thanks, I said, but I couldn't let her get away with that kind of behavior. It's not right. From that day on, I learned to stand up for myself and not let entitled people walk all over me. And while I hope I never encounter the entitled woman again, I know I'll be ready if I do. Enjoying the stories yet? If you do, please subscribe, like, and comment.
So this happened when I was eight. I'm almost 19 now, so it was years back. Maybe a bit cloudy. Also sorry about my spelling and grammar. I'm autistic. First post, so it's probably not well written. So when I was younger, me and my family lived in the back of my dad's shed. It was set up like a house. We were there while our house was being built. It was built by my dad, but only on the weekends as he's a carpenter, and we didn't have the money to get too many other workers. Now, enter the entitled mother Karen, I kid you not. Her name was Karen. So she comes to drop her entitled little crap off at my party. I had to invite everyone in my class, and she decided to stick around. Her EB was the worst party guest. Trying to play with my presence, constantly kicking all the balloons at people who were trying to walk past, he threw a tantrum when I got the first piece of cake, and also threw another when the kid next to him won't pass the passel. And every time the kid got upset, you would have Karen there telling my mother to make the kid give Eb the prize or whatever he wanted because he doesn't have much. We were living in a damn bug-ridden shed because we couldn't afford to finish our house with help and your kid doesn't have much. Mom always just told her to piss off. Now to the end of the day. In walks Karen to the kitchen as we are cleaning the plastic plates up as she lets out a scoff saying rich people with plastic plates. Well, my mom nearly decked her and told her to just leave. You would think that would be the end of Karen, but no pee. So when I was around 12, I ran a coloring competition where I would choose a winner for the prep to two grades. Aussie, then three to six. So this kid's coloring in was one of the worst. You could tell he hadn't tried as it was just scribbled on. And before you say he was just a little kid, think again. He was one of the oldest in the primary school. He was in his final year. So naturally, he didn't win. I chose a winner from each and gave them their prizes which were cheap drawing stuff from the dollar store. And afterwards, Karen once again stomps her way over why didn't Eve win, she asked in her witchy entitled way, as my mother calmly said, because he wasn't the winner. Another kid was, but Karen wasn't happy with that answer and yelled. But E.B. tried the hardest. My mom just said he obviously didn't. He handed it in before the end of the day they were handed out. The witch continued to yell and whine until my godsend of a teacher, let's call her ally, approached us and told Karen, if you keep abusing parents when your child doesn't get something, we will have to report you. I will be alerting the principal. Which, of course, made Karen piss off quickly as the teacher brought me into the classroom and let me pick a toy from the prize box. You got a small prize if you got your name on the whiteboard. And more depending on how many ticks you got, I was a teacher's pet, so I got a lot. And then we went home as it was the end of the day. A week later, we found out Karen was no longer allowed in the gates of the school. She either had to drop the kids off at the gates or send her husband to walk them in. She also shaved her daughter's head when she had nights because she didn't believe in buying a treatment. That poor girl. Not the most interesting story, but I thought it fits. To start off, I'm a 14-year-old male, and there's no specific date for this story as it's a thing that's been going along for my entire life. To give a bit of context for this, The grandma I'm talking about is the one from my mother's side of the family, as the one from my father's had also died in 2017. I never really knew my grandparents from my father's side of the family, but since my dad is a very open person, he shared a lot of his own childhood with me. And while his parents weren't abusive or neglectful, they were far from being parents of the year, leading to my dad studying in Texas rather than Germany, which is where they lived and also where my parents live today. My mother's parents were far better parents overall which I personally think being at least a bit from the fact that my mother's parents were born after born after W-2 while my father's parents were in their 20s while it happened. One little notion that my grandma and my dad don't get along that well was that while I was younger whenever I'd visit my grandparents, it would always be my mother coming along with me and my dad would never join up. The main thing that'll be talking about that happened only last month. My grandparents would be in town a few weeks due to my uncle and aunt who lived next to our house going on a four-week honeymoon trip to London and needed someone to take care of their eight-month-old daughter. They decided to visit us for a dinner while they were there and all was well. But while we were eating and everyone finished their main course, my mother went into the kitchen to prepare the desert. My grandpa, who was a former football player, it was the team of a very small town, so I won't bother mentioning it. He started talking to my dad about his own work life, and while they had very different careers as my dad as a consultant, they always got along very well and had very similar backgrounds, childhoods. They spoke for a while, and then my grandma randomly blurted out her famous well, um, by the way, she does this every time my dad was having a conversation. Before I tell you, a bit of context will be needed. 
My dad and grandfather were mostly talking about what their fathers told them about how it was during W-2. While I am a child, I have no real issues with them doing this, as I also have a personal interest in war history, and my parents and grandpa actually support this interest. However, my grandmother is one of those, oh no child should even know what a gun is, and oh every life is precious and things meant for killing are hell spawn. In summary, she's very naive, who would even treat a 17-year-old like a 5-year-old because they were still one year away from adulthood. What she ended up saying to was, as following... Well, my dad's name. I understand you two talk about this, but still, why would you start a conversation like this with your son here? Before my dad responded, I just decided to say my view, which was that I don't mind them talking about this, and I actually find it quite interesting. Which she followed up with, oh my dear, trust me you don't want to hear about this terrible stuff. I don't know why, but for some reason after my dad just reassured my grandma that I had interest in this stuff, and it was also my current history subject in school, my grandma just snapped. She started yelling at my dad about how him even letting me know about these things made him a terrible father and how he didn't deserve parenthood. She went on for about 30. Seconds before my grandpa said, my grandma's name, just stop, only because my name knows about this and has interest in it and you think that's awful because you were raised differently? It doesn't make my son, in-law, a bad father? She started seeming confused and uncomfortable before deciding to leave, but it doesn't end here. When she got up, she tried to take me with her and took my arm and just said, let's go. I aggressively pulled back my arm and sat back down. When she looked at me confused, my grandpa just gave her one of those go-to-your-room looks that only men in who've been through parenthood seem to be able to do, and she then finally left. My mom came back shortly after with the desert, and when she asked where my grandma was, my grandpa just told her the story, and with my mother being the daughter, she completely understood and believed it. Over dessert, my mother spoke with my dad about how while we would still be coming to my grandparents' golden wedding celebration, which is the name for a couple's 50th wedding day, we would be taking up on the offer that my mom's older sister, or in other words, my second aunt had made us, that the three of us could stay with her family rather than with them. My grandpa completely understood and left about an hour later. That was the end of that, and I'm just happy my grandpa is not the kind of husband to just stand by instead of putting his wife in her place. It did come with one upside, though, as I really liked the aunt and uncle we'd be staying with for the golden wedding party as we'd be there for two weeks before the actual party. They also have two kids, a 20-year-old daughter and 17-year-old son, whom I get along with very well. They also have two dogs who are just the cutest. But back to the point, I'll update this post in case any more outrageous things happen during the time when they're... But for now, there's not much else to say. Just wanted to put this out there and feel free to share any of your opinions on this. My friend worked at a jewelry store, and the attire was a business suit. She loves her job because she is surrounded every day by precious metals and stones. She's a nerd for Victorian fashion or whatever esques there is regarding fashion, balls, princesses, and royalty of Europe. Anyways, the only thing she hated in that job was the manager, Susie. From the account of my friend, Susie has an attitude similar to the fairy godmother from Shrek, very kind in front of customers, but would then bare her teeth when they left. Her favorite pastime was to chat with a customer while criticizing the employees with remarks about their looks, appearance, or how what accessories they wore didn't match their complexion and such. And she seems to have a grudge for my friend, Prolly, because she engages with the customer with minor trivia like, did you know Jade has a hidden meaning and such? And it made a lot of people return to the store. One day, Susie came in extremely pissed and started off with my friend about how she looked. Mind that she dresses as plainly as possible, because she geeks out when it comes to anything fashion related to the 14th century, and that she has to look like what the customer wants to look like. I imagine that a light bulb went off on her head and blood rushing to her face as she thought of things she could wear and whatnot. So for the entire week, which crosses Valentine's Day, she dressed up in gowns and dresses matched with accessories that made her look like a Barbie princess. The entire time, there were people coming up to her about the dress, the accessories, and the theme to which she explained with delight. Susie was steaming the entire time. She tried to get her fired, but the owner was present because of the upcoming holiday and was happy with the increase in sales then. I managed to sneak by and saw her in a white dress that screamed frozen if it had an eastern vibe to it and Susie glaring from the back. I heard she left after the week was over without notice and someone else was promoted, 
My friend wasn't too bothered because the current manager had seniority and was pretty chill, so she's happy. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more captivating stories. Share your own experiences, opinions in the comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.